I grew up in a very small town in the South Island of New Zealand called Timaru, um, and I don't I don't remember a lot of my childhood. I was kind of, you know, your kind of classic toddler that loved Barney and like all of that kind of thing. Um, but then when I was three, kind of everything started to change. Um, and I read my my child protection files recently um, that kind of talk about from, from that age about me going from happy and bubbly to dull and lacking emotion. My files say that from about at the age of three, I was sexually abused by three different men. Um, and so, you know, that, that definitely has a lot to play. But when I look back at my story and kind of everything that happened, um, that that sent me on a, a cycle, a downward, um, you know, a downward spiral. And then there was a whole lot of stuff going on at school as well. So I was being bullied at school. But I think that the biggest thing was just that um, I, I had beliefs in me that I was unlovable, that I was a burden and that I didn't deserve to be here. I just thought that life would be easier if I wasn't here. And so I don't know if as a 12 year old I knew that if I did this that I would never wake up again. But to be honest, I really don't think that I cared. Um, you know, I just wanted the pain to end. a story that I, I shared in my TED talk um, and it's kind of the, the reason why I do everything that I do but it was after my final suicide attempt um, and I was in the psych ward at the time and um, this woman came in her name's Esther and she basically was sitting with me and I was bawling my eyes out and she was like Jazz why are you crying and I turned to her and I was like oh, I'm just so tired of fighting and she looked at me and goes Jazz what do you think the definition of fighting is because I don't think that you're fighting I think you're only surviving and it's only when you learn how to fight that the change that you're longing to see is going to happen um, and so I remember taking that and going shoot like if I've actually just been surviving this whole time and and fighting might change something then I've got to learn how to do that and so that's kind of the moment that I can pinpoint that everything started to change. What I very quickly discovered was that I wasn't fighting my suicidal tendencies or my suicidal behaviours, I was fighting the beliefs that put me there. Um, so the beliefs, I'm unlovable, I'm a burden, um, I don't deserve to be here. And so what I did is that I wrote those beliefs down on a piece of paper, um, I drew a line and then on the other side I wrote down every single thing that people said or did that contradicted those beliefs. Um, so that every time my mind would be, jazz, you're unlovable, jazz, you're a burden, um, I would pull out this list and I would have solid evidence in front of me that my internal reality wasn't matching the external truth um, and then I just you know things like engaging in therapy it's it's really hard when you're going in with the perception that this is your identity therefore it will never change um, and so learning how to separate myself from it so that when I went in to see a therapist I went in with the intention of okay if this is just something I'm struggling with then maybe I can work through it and maybe the psychologist hasn't studied for you know five six years and don't know what they're talking about so um, kind of all things like that that really helped me learn how to fight. I remember, you know, being in the back of the police car after everything had happened and I was just bawling my eyes out and she had her arms around me um, and it was probably about 10 minutes um, later I looked up and I just saw her crying and in my mind I was like, I don't get it, I don't understand why this stranger, um, someone who I've never met before is crying um, because I just tried to take my life, that doesn't make sense to me. And you know, she went above and beyond her job. She was, um, you know, in the ambulance with me, which they do. But then when we got to the hospital, she stayed with me. She um, put her work number into my phone and was like, you need to um, you need to contact me like tomorrow, say that you're OK. Um, I need to know that you're OK because I know that you can get through this. And having someone who genuinely believed in me um, that didn't, you know, that didn't know me, it was it was really bizarre. And 
Um, you know, everything I now get to do, I, I credit to, to Constable Campbell for that night um, because she quite literally physically saved my life. Um, but yeah, she's amazing. And now I get to do a lot of work with police. Um, so I just spoke at a, a conference not, uh, last week actually in New Zealand with a whole lot of officers. Um, so it's kind of done a full 180. I remember walking back into church because I had left for a couple of years. I'd done Bible college and everything before that, but um, I was just so broken and isolated myself. And I remember January 8th, it was, um, you know, years ago, I walked back into um, back into the church and there was this guy by the name of Pastor Lucas Connell preaching. And he has an incredible story of, um, he was in a drug-induced psychosis and like the TV was talking to him and he was sharing this and he was saying that one night in, in a moment, um, he was lying on his floor in his bedroom and crying out to God and he immediately got set free. And I was listening to this and I was like, this is incredible, like what the heck? And so um, I remember sitting there and going, I, God, I, I can't live like this anymore. It's been nine years of suicide attempt after suicide attempt after suicide attempt. I can't do this anymore. Um, and I, I actually just have to give you everything, um, which is scary because people who are suicidal, freedom is one of the most scariest things um, because that means losing control. That means losing relationships that are built upon crisis, all of that. Pastor Lucas did an altar call and there was probably like, 150 people that responded um, and I was down there um, literally front and centre and he was kind of praying over everyone in general and then came over to me um, and started praying and prophesying and in that single moment nine years of suicidal tendencies gone um, nothing since but what I learnt was that um, God was able to do that because I learnt what it was to live free so then when he set me free I didn't run back into my cage um, but yeah, so it's been a massive part of my journey as well as the community and my church. I love my church um, and you know my mentors and everyone's kind of come from there. So it's, it's a massive part for me in my recovery. That was the very first video that I did for Voices of Hope um, and it now has over 80 million views. Um, so it went international, we get hundreds of thousands of messages from people. Um, I think one of my favourites is, it was from a mother in Canada um, and she emailed us and she was like, I, I've been trying to say like email you for a couple of weeks, I haven't known how to say it but my 15 year old daughter um, she had decided that she was going to take her life. She had written her suicide note, um, got every, her method ready, and then um, she just jumped on social media to message her best friend goodbye. At the top of her news feed was your video, Dear Suicidal Me, and so she watched it. Um, and as she watched it, she realized that she didn't want to take her life anymore, so she ran into my room, suicide note in hand. Um, and sure enough, everything was set up in her room. So, you know, saying thank you so much. My daughter's still alive now because of that. Um, and that's one of thousands of messages like that that we've had from from that video and kind of everything else that um, we've been able to create within films for for Voices of Hope. The first thing that I would say is that um, hope is not just a word that we say that hope is never lost but sometimes our situations can stop us from seeing it um, and so what I discovered was that it's not about battling your past but fighting for your future. Um, we spend so long battling the things that have happened to us or battling the things that we've done um, but that really doesn't get us anywhere except in circles and it's only when we choose to look at the future even if it's one day ahead, even if it's one week ahead um, and decide to fight for that knowing that you are so worth it, um, that you're not what your mind is telling you, that you're not a burden, you're not unlovable, you don't deserve to be punished, whatever it is that your mind is telling you um, is, is not true. If you were to tell the girl that was once sitting in the psych ward in the intensive care unit um, that one day this would be what I was doing, I would have laughed at you. Um, and the crazy thing is there was a guy, um, him and his wife have pretty much become my parents, Wayne and Libby, and um, Wayne was sitting with me in the intensive care unit after that final suicide attempt and I was like, you know, I was all medication and like I was really out of it and he just goes, Jazz, I think one day your story might change the world. And I was like, yeah, whatever, like I'm in a psych ward. I don't think so, I'm not even gonna be alive next year. Um, but he saw it before I could. And now to kind of, you know, I, I take, sometimes I literally just have to sit back and look at everything that's happened because everything's going so fast now, um, which is amazing. But to remember where I was um, is so humbling because it's, 
I, I now get to just represent hope in everything that I do, that if I can do it, if the girl from the psych ward can do it, then so can you.